right off, right from the get-go. Um, and these are purely personal thoughts, by the way. Anything I say is, is simply what works for me. It might not work for you, but it's always nice to hear somebody else's viewpoint. And uh, so I you know, encourage you to keep an open mind and, um, and you know, take, take what you can use and leave the rest. Um, for me, playing in an acoustic environment uh, is about listening. And, and playing in an open fashion with musicians that are able to communicate uh, in present time in a conversational way, uh, improvising. And for me, that's a very, very special concept and uh, uh, something that um, is important to me because jazz is, is one of the very few art forms that, allow for the, that allows for this kind of communication uh, in an intimate way in front of an audience. Uh, it's one of the few art forms that allows a group of artists to get together and create something spontaneously uh, every night, night after night, make it up as we go along and do it in such a way uh, that the audience becomes a part of it. Uh, I can't really think of any ar art form where, where that happens to such a degree. I, no other kind of music really. You know, I walk away uh, every night after a concert feeling like I've been transported uh, to some other place. And uh, all of that is about listening and, and closeness with, uh, with fellow musicians on stage. And it's done in a way that's nonverbal. Uh, it's done musically and uh, um, allows for very interesting exchanges. You know, I come from a musical family. My father was an attorney and uh, also a jazz musician on the side. And, uh, you know, we played every night, often at, once we were old enough to play. Uh, there were three of us, my brother Randy, my sister Emily, and myself. And, uh, and, you know, having access to the instruments and watching other people coming over and play them as well uh, had an enormous influence on us. And how old were you then? When you first picked up your first instrument? I first picked up clarinet when I was somewhere six or seven years old. My brother Randy started playing when he was five, I think, started oh. playing trumpet. And when did you start your first lessons? Around the same time. I started with a teacher. Um, I had a, a very good clarinet teacher and studied clarinet for uh, five or six years. And the sax? You started with clarinet and sax? Yeah, I started with just the clarinet and then eventually uh, switched to the to sax. The tenor sax? To the alto sax. Alto sax. Yeah. And then switched to tenor. What made you switch? Was there, was there any reason for that? Uh, the switch to alto was because I was feeling frustrated trying to play jazz on clarinet, uh, partially, and I always loved the saxophone. The, the, the records that I, were listening, that I was listening to at that time were, were mostly saxophone records. Right. And uh, then I heard a saxophonist, a great saxophonist named Cannibal Adderley uh, when I was probably in seventh or eighth grade. And uh, at that point, just I just wanted to play alto. I wanted to have an alto and start to take alto lessons, and my parents agreed. Did your parents uh, want you to pursue uh, a career in music? You know, my parents uh, gave me a lot of support in, in a lot of different areas. Uh, they were, you know, good providers and good support supporters as well. And uh, certainly, they were proud of us. I mean, my father, in particular, since he was a kind of a musician and a frustrated musician, you know, he had a chance to kind of vi vicariously. You know, uh, you know, have have a good time watching us play music mm. as well, and and was very supportive of us choosing music as a livelihood. Um, but we also felt that you know we were supported in whatever choices we would have made. You know, I, I made other forays into you know pre med, and you know I had a lab at home. I was interested in chemistry and biology, and uh, so. Um, but we were all sort of bitten by the music bug. And it was also a good way, I think, when I was a kid, it really got my father's attention. You know, there's a, those kind of elements in there as well. Um, but uh, I remember when I began college, I, I at one point switched to pre-med because I was going to pursue medicine and, uh, and was supported for that as well. But I just ended up at the music school every day, practicing and playing with, uh, with the guys in the school, and then just ended up falling into music. And then when did you decide to go to New York? When I was 19 years old, I actually left school and, and moved to New York. Uh, my father gave me a couple of months rent, uh, money for a couple of months rent, and, uh, and said, you're on your own. 
And I was very lucky because my brother Randy had already been living in New York for a couple of years, pursuing music as a livelihood. So he was really, you know, kind and gracious to me, he introduced me to everybody. Right. Everybody he knew. And he had already kind of made a name for himself. And I just, you know, immediately got some good private teachers and just started trying to make rehearsals and, uh, and whatever, you know, gigs I could get and learn what I could. You know, it was a very, uh, you know, when I think back, it was such a, in a, in a way, an irresponsible decision to, to split school and, and move to New York at 19 years well, old. Well, thank God you did. Well, it worked out for me. It, it ended up, I, w I was lucky and I had the support of my brother, you know, and my parents as well, you know, so. And I started working fairly early, so the, the two or three months rent that, you know, that my parents gave me, um, I didn't really need any money after that. I started making enough money to support myself. Who were your influences at that time in New York? Uh, certainly John Coltrane was a huge influence and right, I was right in the thick of it at that point. He had been an influence uh, you know, since I was in high school. But, you know, countless other people, you know, Miles Davis certainly was a huge influence and, uh, you know, a lot of piano players, uh, McCoy Tyner, Herbie Hancock, uh, uh, people that I was playing with at the time, Dave Liebman, um, uh, there was a saxophonist named Jim Pepper who was a, a great influence on me. I had heard him play on a record and somehow that changed my life. Um, and I, I mean the list is, is huge. I'm kind of blanking out right no, now, it's but right. it's a lot of people. And the dreams happened in New York, didn't they? Dreams happened in 1970. Uh, my brother and I uh, were signed with a gentleman named Barry Rogers. Uh, signed to Columbia Records under Clive Davis at that right. point. To, uh, this was a, a rock band with horns, much like uh, Blood, Sweat and Tears in Chicago. But the only difference was we were uh, really pretty much jazz musicians in this group, but we, you know, we were jazz musicians that had grown up listening to rock and playing R&B. And, uh, and we made up the horn parts every night. We improvised them. They weren't written out, mm -hmm. which was uh, you know, quite different. And you also did three CDs, which were totally improv. We did two with Dreams. Two with Dreams, yeah. right. And they weren't Pardon actually me. totally improv, um, but there was a lot of improv on them. Yeah. And so you enjoy improv and, and going into the studio? Is, is there a difference? W which you prefer? Well, I really enjoy improv, uh, improvising li in a live setting with other musicians that are you know, capable of creating you know, spontaneously you know, in the now, in the present moment. Uh, I mean, there's nothing like it with, you know, that kind of intimate uh, interaction with other musicians that are capable of that. And in the studio, I enjoy that as well, though it's a different experience. And in the studio, one has to come in a lot more prepared. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, I certainly, you know, arrive at a session, you know, if it's my own session, with music that's very well prepared and thought out. And then since it's done that way, we're able to improvise because we know what the parameters are. And, uh, and then we're able to really be spontaneous. Which you prefer as a musician, uh, even as a musician celebrity, playing uh, the Brecker Brothers or, or playing solo by yourself or having played with all these, which I love to talk about, all these great uh, musicians in the past? In the I love band. it all. There's not one that... I love it all. You know, I, the, ex the experience and the ability to get up and play um, with musicians whom I love, you know, both musically on stage and off stage, you know, I, I like it all. Uh, I just enjoy playing music, right. and uh, whether it's with my own group, which I love doing, uh, or going out and and uh, and playing, uh, you know, with my brother, which I love doing, um, and that you know, each one involves quite a kind of a different repertoire and a different approach, and it's it keeps it fresh for me, changing up. You know, I think I would get, probably get tired of constantly leading my own group and having to, uh, uh, you know, it would keep me busy constantly changing the music because I like, uh, I don't like to get stuck. Um, but the ability to be able to shift and play with somebody else, either as a, you know, as a special guest or as a, in a collaboration, um, you know, I really enjoy. <laughs> Moving on to uh, material, which is a, you know it's a huge topic, um, and uh, I mean uh, you know I don't know how much we can cover it here, and it involves composition and uh, and writing tools and assembling uh, tunes. I happen to like to write. Uh, I never initially 
it was never one of my favorite things when I first started uh, becoming a professional music. And um, the way I learned to write was, was out of necessity, really. I was uh, playing in the Brecker Brothers with my brother Randy, and we had kind of scored a hit record in 1975, and my brother had written the whole record. Uh, with the exception of one tune w that we all made up together, and that one particular tune became a hit. Uh, and I thought that this was going to be kind of a one-record deal, one-shot thing, and, it, and uh, I was just there to, you know, just kind of play in the band and have fun. And uh, all of a sudden, we were slated to record again pretty quickly, and then I felt like I needed to contribute to this thing in some way, because I felt guilty that I hadn't written anything. So I started writing in... Uh, in the style of my brother Randy, which is very difficult to do, uh, because he had a very unique, uh, has and had a very unique style of writing that's really uncopyable. But that's how I got started writing, and eventually I, st I studied composition and uh, struggled with it quite a bit, uh, until really the last 10 years where it's become something that I enjoy uh, doing. Um, generally, I write uh, with various intentions in mind. Um, you know, when writing for an acoustic ensemble, I'm thinking often about what the vehicle for the improvisation is going to be, what the ry rhythmic vehicle is going to be, uh, how open it's going to be, whether it's going to be fun. Uh, the, the final test after I finished a tune, and usually I keep maybe one out of, you know, one out of four things that I've written, but uh, the final test for me is usually whether I'm going to enjoy playing this thing every night. Um, because invariably that's what's going to happen. And uh, so uh, tunes are written. Um, the ideas for writing for me can come from anywhere. It can come from a rhythmic uh, idea. Can, it can come from a harmonic idea. It can come from the piano, come from the saxophone, come from the computer. Uh, I can hear it in the shower, hear it while I'm driving a car. You know, all those things you hear about or, or have experienced already. Um, but the idea is to come up with vehicles for me uh, in, you know, most of the time that, that work in a live situation. Not every tune that, that I've written and recorded work, uh, work live. Uh, sometimes we'll try it and find out that it's better as a recording tune and not great for a live ensemble. You know, there are many tools uh, in, that, that are useful for writing. Um, you know, for me, the computer is, uh, has become an important tool, although most of the times uh, most of the time for me in writing, uh, the, the tunes begin on the saxophone or piano and eventually make their way to the computer. One rule of thumb for me, and I can't stress this enough for all of you that, uh, that are out there that are, that are attempting to write or, and, it's, and succeeding at it, the important thing for me is to finish a tune that I've started uh, and not to let it sit around and half finished and say, oh, I'll finish it some other time. Uh, whether it's a whether the ending or whether the the bridge or the the whole composition, whether I like it or not, I you know I make a very uh, um, I make a solid attempt to finish every uh, everything that I start. Uh, there seem to be kind of two styles to this. For me, it works better to finish it, so it's not you know kind of lingering in the back of my brain, and I build up a whole kind of backlog of unfinished material that I don't know how to finish, and then I start feeling overwhelmed and don't even want to go near it. Um, and if I finish a song and don't like the way it's finished, I can always come back and change it. But at least it's kind of off of the, it's off the back shelf, you know, and it's, and it's in the running. Um, my brother Randy actually has a different technique that works for him. Uh, he kind of uses the, uh, the uh, kind of jigsaw puzzle approach where he'll have an A section, he'll write a great A section or five A sections that have nothing to do with each other and a bunch of other sections that could be a good bridge or a good B section or C section or chorus. Um, and then he kind of shuffles them around and sometimes, sometimes ends up with really startling results. Um, and that, that occasionally has worked for me as well in the past, but generally I prefer for me to try and through write something. Um, there's a tendency for, for me less to, to jump around and, and have a more consistent thought How much uh, do you think of a student of jazz do you have to be and does that 
correlate to how good of a player you are? Um, certainly, uh, yeah, being a student of jazz does correlate, I think, uh, to how good a player you are. I think, you know, um, all of the good, really good players I know are all students of the music and have studied every kind of facet of it, you know, maybe different facets, but a lot of different areas. Uh, and I think, um, in a way, it helps, and this is always the, the little catch-22 uh, with jazz, is that the audience has to be a little bit of a student as well. Mm. Just a little bit, you know. It helps to know maybe the tr a bit of the traditions, a bit of the lineage, you know, how, why one person sounds the way he does and, and what came before that and what makes him so amazing because he's taken it to some other place or level. That also combined with uh, just maybe a knowledge about um, you know, f forms, musical forms, so that when you hear, for instance, a jazz musician improvising, you there's some understanding about what's going on. What he's, you know, he's not just standing up there, you know, making a bunch of sounds, but there's actually a, a logic uh, and an intelligence behind it. Um, so yes to both. Great. Can we talk about the Brecker brothers? Sure. The success and, and how did how did the Brecker brothers get started? Uh, it started, well, my brother and I, again, had been playing uh, together for years. We right. were playing in a group called Dreams, uh, many other groups. We played, uh, you know, we recorded with Dreams. We then joined Horace Silver together again and then played uh, for a year with Billy Cobham and Spectrum right. and made a number of records with him. And during that time, you know, we used to record a lot in the city. We toured and we also made a lot of jam sessions. I always used to show up. There was a kind of a loft scene in New York where there was a lot of music being played. We all lived in lofts because we could make, a loft was an abandoned factory sort of made livable. And uh, they were large, you know, habitable places where you could make a lot of noise and not bother neighbors. Um, it's too bad you didn't invest in three or four of them. <laughs> yeah, that would have been nice. Um, who knew? Uh, but. Uh, during this period, my brother Randy had been writing some really brilliant compositions, and we had been playing them every week uh, at our friend Don Grolnick, a wonderful pianist at his house. Uh, we'd get together with my brother and myself, Dave Sanborn, just for fun and play these tunes. And uh, oh, that's... we were approached by, Clive Dav by uh, Arista Records and Clive Davis to, uh, to make a record uh, for them. Clive had just started Arista Records and had signed Barry Manilow, and he signed us. Uh, and that was the beginning wow. of the That's record. Pretty good company. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, uh, Barry Manilow had a hit right from the from the beginning. Had a, a hit record called Mandy, which got the whole record company really started. And uh, and my brother and I were really fortunate to kind of be in the right place at the right time. And he had also written some, you know, f unbelievably creative uh, and interesting music that was kind of like jazz funk but really different from anything that had been recorded, but anything different from anything I had ever Absolutely. heard. Absolutely. I mean, the, you were very innovative at that time, quite different. So I started trying to learn how to write, kind of, because I realized I better contribute something to this. You know, I felt bad that I hadn't written anything after that first record, because I realized we were going to make more records. Right. You know, so I started trying to write kind of in, in, in my brother Randy's, uh, kind of in that genre, kind of difficult thing to do. I try to write on a regular basis. It's difficult when traveling, uh, unless I have some time in one place. Uh, and often deadlines help, you know. Right. But I still, even without a deadline, I still try and keep my, you know, my hands in writing. Um, I write when I'm home, uh, and uh, I, I have gotten to the point where I sort of enjoy the experience of writing. You know, I don't always, I don't always come up with something, uh, but I get very excited when, I, when something comes out that I like. Which is better for you, to actually sit down and write note by note or improvisation? Both. There are different ways of writing. And it's funny that you would ask that because that, that is one approach. Uh, sometimes I'll just play the saxophone and record it and then, and then kind of glean. Edit it down. Yeah. Here, you know, I might record for 20 minutes and then find a couple of phrases that, uh, that attract my ear and then I'll uh, you know, find a way to, to harmonize them and come up with a, you know, and start moving it around. That's an, an interesting way to write. And there are other ways, you know, such as just sitting at the piano, which right. is the more common way for me. What, what does recording in the studio do for you versus being out on the road 
and touring and playing with other musicians in a band or very different experience um, a different way of thinking even though it, a lot of the same tools are used a lot of the same crafts come into being um, or come into play uh, but the studio in a way is a, is a is a can often be a more constricted format there's no audience and right. often you're separated depending on how you set up you can be separated from other musicians and only kind of see them and hear them through earphones um, nevertheless there, it brings out a kind of de degree of, of concentration and, and accuracy um, and, a, and, a, and an approach to the music that's very different from the live experience and, and you can really have a good time in the studio you know, the studio become, becomes another instrument unto itself and allows you to do things that you, you know, you can't do live. You know, particularly using, you know, tools such as editing, et cetera, et cetera. Right. How do you prepare for performances, Michael? Um, it depends on the, on the type of, of performance. Uh, but, you know, I'll hopefully have the music in my hands and at least look at it. If, if it's really difficult, I'll practice it. You know, sometimes I'll have a CD or something and practice with it. Um, you know, I'm constantly practicing the instrument anyway. Um, but beyond that, if it's my own concert, um, I'll think about what we're going to play, uh, what order we're going to play the tunes, mm -hmm. uh, what, you know, uh, and, and how we're going to deliver it, how it's going to be paced, in, just in a loose way, you know. And uh, beyond that, the rest of it's created uh, pretty spontaneously. So and that's, not that's a lot the of beauty rehearsal. of it. Oh, uh, oh, rehearsal. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> rehearsal, uh, sound checks. There's sound checks. There's not a lot of rehearsals. Right. Uh, I do rehearse, you know, maybe one day, you know. Occasionally, if it's if it's all, if it's a lot of new music, maybe two days. The zone on a on a consistent basis has taken me a long time to sort of feel comfortable with, um, and really, I've only started feeling comfortable. I'm sad to say, maybe in the last ten years. I'm 54 now, um, and. You know, I moved to New York City when I was 19 years old, uh, but as I said, I grew up in a kind of musical family. My father was a, an attorney and a, and a jazz pianist, um, so there were always musicians at the house. And uh, I started playing in jam sessions by the time I was in high school and um, began to uh, kind of assemble a musical personality even back then, and, you know, and I took private lessons and moved to New York and played as much as possible uh, with other musicians and really tried to seek out people that were better than me, which wasn't hard. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I asked a lot of questions and played a lot. Uh, the, one of the first big influences for me was a guy named Eric Ravat, who was a great drummer in the Philadelphia area, who eventually went along to play with, uh, he moved to New York and played with Weather Report. And, uh, but that was, those were very important um, experiences. Uh, I played a lot with people when I first moved to New York. We had, there was a thing that we used to refer to affectionately as the loft scene in the early 70s. And a lot of the musicians had lofts uh, simply because the, they were, it was possible to play in a loft, which was an abandoned factory. They were terrible for living, but great for noise because it would be surrounded by other abandoned factories and, uh, and you could play all night make any amount of noise and, and not have to suffer uh, complaints from the, uh, from the neighbors. Uh, and I worked out a lot of things in these jam sessions, mostly just how to communicate with other musicians uh, musically. And eventually, when we all started, um, when the law scene kind of ended uh, for that particular generation, we all started being hired and, and forming our own bands or being hired by other groups and where we were no longer around to do it. Um, we took those experiences and, and, and um, let it kind of subconsciously dictate who we became. And as I said, it was like the beginning of building 
of little building blocks of musical personalities. Um, and a lot of this stuff, a lot of the basic personalities, you know, I think, a lot of the guys I know were really formed in the early, those early sessions, you know. Uh, you know, I know that my basic, my basic musical um, sort of leanings were, were really shaped in the early days. You know, I've tried to learn a lot since then and continue to. Right now I've been uh, uh, studying Bulgarian wedding music, strangely enough. I've totally fallen in love with that music and I'm taking lessons now uh, with a Bulgarian violinist in New York. And um, I, sometimes I think I'm insane, um, but I'm really having fun with it. And I, you know, sit around for hours trying to learn these melodies, uh, which are really hard for me to learn. I'm, uh, as I'm getting older, it's harder for me to memorize stuff. Um, but you know, hopefully, this new information that I'm just, I'm just, I, I see my my psyche and brain as kind of a you know, partially as a computer, I'm just putting information in right now. And I'm hoping that subconsciously it's going to mutate uh, into some kind of compositional, uh, it actually already has. Um, I'm hoping to write some things based on, on this language, but I'm trying to learn the language first before I, you know, really commit things uh, to paper and pencil and, com and computer. Um, but still, to get to your question, to feel comfortable in a zone, I think just play a lot. You know, play a lot with other people. Practice a lot, play a lot. Take lessons and then play a lot. And play with people that are better than you. And ask a lot of questions. And then uh, um, one other thing that for me to feel comfortable often, um, you know, again, it's, that's what I was talking about is chemistry. You know, it, I'm at the point where I kind of surround myself with musicians who I'm comfortable playing with, or who push me, uh, you know, in ways that I need to be pushed. Um, that combined with with composition, and you know, writing for myself or or choosing tunes that I feel highlight, or either can steer me in a direction that I haven't been in, or can highlight things that are that are kind of characteristic of my musical personality, um, helps as well. Uh, generally, each project that I take on uh, is something that I haven't done before. Uh, and it's something new for me. It might not be new for somebody else, but I don't care. Um, but it's, you know, something that's new for me that, that I can learn from, but also bring my own musical experiences too, and there's a funny meeting place there. Um, so all of that in mind, I think, um, has contributed to me, you know, being comfortable most of the time. Um, I have to add one other thing. I still get nervous. Um, you know, I still question on a nightly basis, you know, not so much if I'm actually on tour, but before a tour, if I haven't been playing, like I haven't been playing in a week and a half, two weeks now. Uh, and I always wonder, there's always a part of me that says, well, do I remember how to do it? You know. Uh, and then finally, when I get up there and start to play, it might not be the first night, but generally it is. Then, then it starts to click again, because it's all there. Uh, you know, it's all, it's, it hasn't gone anywhere, but sometimes after not doing it, it you know, something that be, that has come so natural for me, I, I think that well, maybe I can't do it anymore. Um, and I, you know, I've corroborated that with a lot of other musicians. I'm not alone with that. It's good to ask questions and find out that you know that we're basically part of the human race, and uh, that others have the same, you know, kind of fleeting thoughts. <laughs>
mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Um, and there are good aspects to that as well as aspects that are probably not good. And it's hard for me to comment. Uh, uh, I've gotten to a point where I enjoy it when people are taping. Um, I don't mind at all. Um, because for me it's a way to get the music out there as mm -hmm. well. Um, but it's going to change, uh, drastically change, I think, as uh, in the years to come. And certainly, the way record, uh, record, the record business is run, it's already changing it quite a bit. And uh, I don't know where it's going. What's What's next for for Michael Brecker? Uh, next is um, uh, I have an album out right now that's uh, called White Angles that. Uh, involves 15 musicians. We call it the Quindectet. Uh, uh, and um, I've been traveling and playing the music with this ensemble. We just finished three weeks in Japan. Uh, we'll be touring Europe this summer and playing, you know, various uh, dates in the States as well. We'll be at the Hollywood Bowl and Carnegie Hall and on and on. Um, and I'm very excited about that project. And uh, also uh, planning to go out uh, in the spring of next year with Herbie Hancock and Roy Hargrove again, That's great. which is always fun, always a, you know, it's a wonderful group of musicians. And, uh, and also playing in a group called Tenor Summit, which uh, is a group that features Joe Lovano and Dave Liebman and myself all playing tenors and sopranos and other instruments. The three tenors. The three tenors, yeah, except we <laughs> didn't use that. We didn't go there. We went there for I'm a minute. I'm glad you yeah. didn't. <laughs> <laughs> it was tempting. Um, and so that's a project that we've been doing. We just recorded, and uh, there's an album coming out, and we've been doing some touring with that as well. And I'm also, you know, uh, playing with various small groups that I have. I have a, a, a quartet and a quintet that travels quite a bit. You know, so, I, you know, and I'm working towards making this next record. So I'm, I've been pretty busy. So is there any is there anything you haven't done? Yeah, of course. There's a lot of yeah. that you're going to do. Well, uh, yeah. There's all. I mean, there's you know tons of things I haven't done, and uh, and that's what keeps it interesting. Right. Uh, and you know, hopefully, I'll get to a few more of these things. You know, uh, in the next few years. Well, let's talk about the the iwi. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. Um, the iwi is an electronic wind instrument. It was originally created in the very early 80s, 1980, 1981, by a gentleman named Niall Steiner. At that time, he was living uh, in L.A., and he, was a, he is a uh, really great trumpet player and also an inventor, an electrician, and, and, uh, and dreamer. And uh, he invented a trumpet version of this electronic wind instrument and a saxophone version. And what it is, essentially, is a wind-driven... I used, to be, I used to say a wind-driven synthesizer, and it really isn't even a synthesizer now. It's a wind-driven controller, for lack of a better word, that is capable of triggering, other, uh, triggering a computer or another synthesizer and, uh, in a very expressive way. And, and uh, uh, it's an electronic instrument that uh, can play a whole orchestra from Venus, you know. Uh, and it, I began to play it in the mid-80s and, uh, and took to it pretty much mm -hmm. immediately um, and played it for a good, you know, 11 or 12 years every day and built on it and learned about it and, and loved every minute of it, except when things would break. Um, <laughs> and after a while, uh, I put it down for, you know, for a few years be because the amount of equipment I was traveling with got to be too unwieldy and I just needed to take a little respite from it and just concentrate on woodwinds. And as of late, it's kind of come back into being a new version of it, which I'm excited about. Niles made a new, originally, by the way, the original model was purchased by Akai, uh, which is a Japanese electronics right. company, and they made a great version of it, um, which is on the market, was on the market, and still on the market. And I think that they're getting ready to now make this new version. And uh, I've been playing it using a laptop instead of all the equipment. Now, with the advent of faster processing speed and a lot of memory in, in mm -hmm. computers, you know, we have the ability to have all of these synthesizers inside the computer, and they do the job really well. So now it's just iwi and laptop.
sound alone. Uh, I haven't even begun layering things yet. Uh, that's not a bad guitar, though. <laughs> not great. Try this. using transformers we're able to take these are by the way these sounds are all just little simple logic sounds using the logic sampler uh, as a thing called the ex exs uh, exs uh, and uh, now i'm going to trigger reason within logic Sounds really ridiculous. <laughs> but here are a couple of reason sounds that, again, I did last night. That one's kind of nice. But here's the cool thing. I can now take these sounds and rotate them within logic. Uh, you kind of have to look at the possibility of this and not, these sounds are really not good, but uh, the possibilities you'll hear. and voice leading uh, happening somewhat, maybe one-third arbitrarily. I'm pr I programmed it last night to do these particular chords in rotation, but they're, they're in rotation, but not parallel. What do you think of the young musicians starting out and, you know, their, their um, influences and where they're going in the music you're hearing now? Well, I think it's a challenging time for young musicians, uh, particularly in view of commercially what is uh, uh, out there, you know, certainly on the radio and on TV, you know, which is all good music as well. Um, but in the area of playing jazz and being an instrumentalist, it makes it challenging because a lot of the music on, on TV and on the radio and everything is kind of um, sampled and cut and pasted in a computer, right. you know, done by very capable people, um, no less, and done well. Uh, and done imaginatively, and it's and you know I know that that must be a very strong pull towards you know that there must be a a, a a strong pull into that way of thinking about music, and that's also you know a great way to create music. Um, but for somebody that wants to be an instrumentalist, that requires a whole other set of tools. You know, a lot of practicing, a lot of studying, a lot of harmony, uh, and just technical discipline in order to do that and you know so that it doesn't become a lost art and I think what's happening is uh, that that's creating stronger musicians um, because to be a jazz musician a, a musician that is really a prof proficient instrumentalist and can play with with good imagination as well you really have to have your thing together uh, in a in a you know in a society sort of where that's not supported, it's not popular. So in order to, to be able to get over and get your message across, you have to have it together. And I think that's what we're seeing. I, certainly I'm seeing it you know, in the States in New York um, with a lot of the instrumentalists that are moving to New York you know, every year. There's, there's some freakily, freakily great players, mm -hmm. you know, um, almost better than I've ever seen. You know, uh, and they keep coming and, they, and they're, they're good and they have to have it together. 
And I think the same thing happens here as well. It's the same phenomenon. What about the audiences? Because you've played all over the world. Mm -hmm. And is there a difference between the jazz audiences in New York and here in the States and Canada, Japan? Is there a difference? Not in the large cosmopolitan areas. You know, playing for a good audience in New York is, you know, is incredible. Playing for a good audience in Toronto, you know, is fantastic. Same thing in, uh, um, in Japan, uh, Europe. There is maybe a difference, though. You know, I mean, certainly in the Americas, um, once you get outside of the cosmopolitan areas, it gets a little dicey. Whereas uh, in Europe and Japan, uh, jazz is, is really, really supported. Uh, both by the you know uh, various arts slash government agencies mm -hmm. and also by the fact that the you know people understand the music have kind of a long time association with it and appreciate it for what it is and and often in Europe you can take a few more chances creatively that might be harder to do in smaller places in the states or in Canada um, you know we're we're maybe more addicted uh, here and you know myself as well to television and and mm -hmm. and you know, in the media. I don't know if I've ever been particularly a, a concrete goal setter um, because it's more been the, the journey, the getting there than the, than the actual. I don't know, know if I would ever know that I've attained anything. Uh, occasionally in a piece of writing I can feel like something was accomplished, but the, the rest of this stuff is always a work in progress for me, particularly since it's jazz and it involves creating. And I never looked, although it doesn't sometimes sound like that, I never looked at technique for technique's sake. It was always part of a whole picture. Um, never been able to practice purely mechanical things, um, unless they were involved in some kind of harmonic concept that I was possibly going to be able to use or expand on. But I think maybe some of the things you're, you're saying are correct, and maybe when I was practicing a lot more, uh, I had more stricter goals, uh, but I certainly don't these days. Um, I'm just happy to be able to get next to the instrument and occasionally learn something new. Usually if I feel that I have a, enough of a grasp of it, you know, I can, I can move on. And sometimes it just happens naturally. Um, I probably never learn anything as much as I should, but it's usually enough where I feel uh, like I, it's not becoming mechanical, you know. And uh, something, you know, will always place itself in front of me at that point anyway. It, it kind of is a natural process. Another, well, there's so many things to think about. Uh, it, in terms of presentation of material. You know, I like to use material from, from other people in the group as well. And I have right now three or four groups. I have the quindectet, I have two quartets that kind of interchange. When, when people are available in one, I'm able to use that. If they're not available, I go to the other quartet. There's also a quintet, and those are the basic formats that I use. I like to play music uh, written by uh, by people in the band. And I also like to use uh, occasionally uh, reharm or rearrangements of, of standards. I generally, for me, this is again extremely personal. Um, I'm, I ne haven't been a big fan of just playing standards for standards sake. Even though um, the music from that repertoire certainly um, made its mark on me when I was growing up. I played uh, you know, st standards with my father often. My father was a jazz pianist. Um, it never f totally felt representative of who, who I am. And I also never felt like I had anything um, or as much of my own to say in a standard format unless I was able to rearrange a standard. Um, and uh, important for presentation is certainly um, is the arc of any concert. And there's many ways to do this. this that involves, um, you know, again, everyone's own particular musical sensibilities. But, you know, uh, things to think about is, you know, variation in repertoire, variation in rhythmical feels, uh, variation in tempo. You don't generally want to play two really fast tunes in a row or two ballads in a row in, uh, in a concert or songs that are often in the same key. Um, and uh, sometimes in a, in a concert you might want to play shorter 
and, and allow for you know, encores and uh, audience response. Um, it's very helpful in a concert setting to break things up, to allow people to play solos or duets. Uh, and I'm, you know, I have been a big fan of playing solo saxophone and actually have been doing solo concerts the last couple of years, um, which end up being sort of uh, partially um, um, kind of a retrospective almost. I do a lot of talking because I get tired uh, from playing 15 minutes straight and I, I find that I have to talk uh, just to break it up and get some rest. So I, you know, I tell stories, uh, kind of really out, uh, funny things from, uh, from tours and and uh, and find that uh, that I have kind of a whole repertoire of solo saxophone tunes that are that are fairly effective and fun, um, and throwing those in occasionally in a, in a in a concert is uh, effective as well. Um, also, uh, there's you know I almost hate to say this stuff because you know it's so relative and so personal and different in every context. I plan, but with my own groups, uh, I try not to play too long, which famous last words, um, in any solo or any given solo context. Uh, I try and abbreviate what I have to say or say it in a way that's concise. At the same time, leaving it open for for kind of a uh, um, What's the expression? Train of consciousness? That's, that's not the... Um, stream of consciousness. St stream of consciousness. Uh, allowing that process to happen, but not in a way that's long-winded. And my very first experience with that was on my first bona fide jazz gig with Morris Silver in 1973. Uh, it was my first night on the gig, and uh, we were playing Song for My Father, which was his uh, kind of big hit and the song that he was identified with at, at the time, people in the audience always used to call out for it and it happened to be kind of a tenor extravaganza. And uh, I would be, you know, the tenor solo was always the last solo on that tune and that was kind of a, that was the big climax of the song. And uh, uh, I got up there and I started playing uh, my solo on Song for My Father and I had played for a while and thought that I was doing a great job. And Horace turned around to me and at the, top of his young's lungs yelled, gone, G-O-N-E, gone. And uh, I thought he was saying, go on. <laughs> I didn't know that uh, gone was kind of bebop lingo for stop. You know, you've said it, you've had enough, you know, end it. So I thought he said, go on. I, th I thought he was enjoying it. So I, I bared down harder. <laughs> and uh, after another minute or a half or two minutes, he yelled around, now frustrated and said, gone. I said, all right, I'm going to, you know, <laughs> great, fantastic. Um, eventually, I ended it probably after 10 or 15 minutes, and he, uh, and he came up to me after the show, and, and he said, you know, when I say gone, that means stop. And that was the first inkling I had of uh, any kind of um, way of editing myself to affect a better presentation. It was the f first time I ever became aware of presentation, really, in any way that made sense was with Horace. Uh, and he was a very good teacher, a great band leader, uh, gave us an enormous amount of freedom. At the same time, uh, uh, he knew how to, you know, for his own musical sensibilities, knew how to put on a, a good show. And, uh, and so I learned a lot in that environment and, and try to hold on to some of that to this day. Um, did you want to say something? Yeah, I want to do a backtrack just a second. Some of the tunes that you write are what I would call harmonically sophisticated, somewhat complex. Is any of that founded in any of the uh, theory or composition you may have had at Indiana University or is this a culmination of years of experience? Any formal study? Um, it's a culmination, of, I think, of, of 35 years of, of, uh, of trying to write and playing other people's tunes and finding out what it is that, that works for me. Um, I've had the, the fantastic opportunity and privilege of playing in so many different 
ensembles over the years in playing the music of really great writers, you know, beginning with Horace Silver and, uh, and Herbie Hancock, McCoy Tyner, uh, Chick Corea, on and on. And, uh, and they all have very different musical sensibilities and write in really different ways. And, uh, but all of them had an effect on me. And part of the beauty of being around them was hoping that some of it would rub off, you know. And um, so I'd have to also include my brother in that, in that lineage as well, because he's, you know, I really consider him one of the great writers of, of the last few decades. And um, you can't help but be affected rhythmically, harmonically, and sensibility-wise from all, you know, all of these things. And the li I mean, the list goes on. So there's that combined with, of course, uh, many attempts at trying to write things. You know, I, I have written a lot, as I said, maybe one out of four things remain, you know. That combined with, with studying, with taking lessons. Um, you know, and I've had various forays in the past, um, beginning studying with David Baker at, at Indiana University. That, um, but I didn't really study composition with him. I studied the Schillinger system for a while when I first moved to New York, which was very interesting. Um, eventually took lessons for a few years with a guy named Edgar Grana in the beginning of the 80s, which was, we did counterpoint. And, you know, just really looking at the tools of composition. And then just started to write. Even though there is some routine involved in practicing, um, maybe it's better not to think of it as a routine. Uh, it might be more palatable. Or of course, as Pat was telling me before, we could all each hire somebody to practice for us. Um, um, <laughs> Send you my heart. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but obviously it goes without saying that practice uh, is very, very important part, if not the most important part, or one of the most important parts uh, involving becoming a musician. You know, hours, sometimes hours and hours of practice go a long way. And uh, uh, when I was younger, I certainly spent a lot of time uh, in the practice room. I had very good private teachers uh, who expected a lot. And also, I was obsessed with the music and driven. Uh, so, you know, I had many days of, you know, many hours of practicing in the shed. And uh, I w if I would be honest, I would say I practice much less now. Um, for a few reasons. Part of it is just a time constraint. There's never enough time in the day anymore now. I wish the day, each day was twice as long. Um, so practicing, uh, the art and technique of practicing has taken up a different space in my mind. And I do, I do get next to the instrument every day when I'm home. As, and I, also traveling on the road, as I mentioned, I go to sound checks early and, uh, and warm up. When I'm home, uh, the hours spent practicing are much less. Uh, sometimes it's purely maintenance practicing, just uh, to make sure the reads are happening, to at least play the horn for a period of time during the day, uh, just so that uh, I don't lose whatever chops I have when I'm not playing on the road or playing in New York City. And then uh, there are other times when I'm actively pursuing something and trying to get it, make it part of my vocabulary. And, uh, but I have no routine anymore. And I don't know if I ever really had a routine, but um, I certainly have done things in the past that have been very, very helpful. Um, I uh, began listening to records at a very early age. I used to steal records from my father's collection. Uh, and I think one of the first records I fell in love with, uh, with I must have been seven, or eight years old was a Dave Brubeck record and it was called "Look for the Tune Was Look for the Silver Lining," with Paul Desmond, and I loved Paul Desmond's sound on alto. And um, I remember having a record. Uh, I was playing clarinet at this point, and feeling frustrated with the instrument uh, because I liked saxophone and trumpet, and I c couldn't quite get the freedom on the clarinet. Of course, I was only eight or nine years old at this point. But um, I was practicing in my trash can, by the way. I had a brass uh, trash basket that if I played, I discovered if I played the clarinet in the wastebasket, it gave me a good reverb. 
and I, I've been in love with reverb ever since. It's hard for me to hear my own sound as identifiable because I'm used to it. You know, I live with it every day, so, you know, so it's hard for me to hear it that way. Um, but I think for someone else, maybe it's not so hard. Um, and it's important to be able to, this is a tough one, and I don't even know if I can articulate it, but to accept that what it is about you is okay. You know, to let that be and not change it. That each one of us has our, even though we're all, you know, emotionally very similar, we're constructed similarly, you know, we're all human beings, and all, but we each have our own specialness. And, and it's being okay with that and not trying to change it. Um, because then that's different for someone else. When someone else hears it, that's not part of their reality. And I try and keep that in mind with my sound. There are times there are things that I don't like in the sound, but I have to remember, but wait a minute, but maybe this is who I am, and maybe that's okay. Thank you. 